Headline as the coronavirus outbreak worsens, health officials now confirming more than 800 fatalities, surpassing the total death toll in the entire SARS pandemic. At the same time, another jump in confirmed cases on that cruise ship off Japan we've been telling you about. Now some 70 cases on that ship, including at least a dozen Americans. The ship's still under quarantine tonight, and ABC's Maggie Ruley is there in Yokohama. Tonight, the novel coronavirus spreading among the thousands of passengers quarantined aboard the Diamond Princess in Yokohama. Six more cases confirmed today, bringing the total number of passengers infected to 70, including at least 12 Americans. Milena Basso and Guy Cerullo celebrating their honeymoon on the cruise, quarantined in their room. Just imagine like a knot in your stomach all day, every day. How is your mental health? How's your head doing? Our heart's like beating so fast. And like when we take our temperature, we're like panicking. And luckily it's mm -hmm. like, okay, 98.6, good. More than 37,000 people affected worldwide. At least 812 people have died, mostly in mainland China. The death toll soaring beyond the SARS outbreak of 2002. The U.S. Embassy confirming the first death of an American, a 60-year-old living in Wuhan, ground zero for the epidemic. Officials scrambling this weekend to build makeshift hospitals. A cavernous convention center converted to a dorm for the thousands infected. Slogans reading, stay strong, Wuhan, stay strong, China. Elsewhere in China, officials cracking down on those refusing to self-quarantine. Authorities in hazmat suits dragging these people from their home. Frank Wisinski and his three-year-old daughter returned to America from China, forced to leave behind his infected wife and father-in-law. She told me that the doctors had told her that her father has one or two more days uh, before he passes. Those images out of China just shocking. Maggie Ruley joins us now from Japan. And Maggie, as the virus continues to spread on that cruise ship just behind you, there's a growing concern tonight that this quarantine may be putting healthy people at risk on board. Yeah, exactly, Tom. That couple we spoke with told us that they're refusing to go above deck with other people. They're not even letting anyone inside their room to come clean it. Now, Tom, today, Princess Cruises did announce they're offering everyone on board a full refund. Tom. Four new cases of the disease, including two healthcare workers who tested positive for the virus, and a medical center in Brighton on the south coast of England is now closed. Overall, there are eight confirmed cases in the UK. For more on this, let's speak to Dr. Richard Darwood. He is a specialist in travel medicine, joins us live via Skype. First of all, what does this declaration from the health department mean? Well, we're now entering uh, uncharted territory because it's actually a very, very long time since quarantine laws have been invoked in this country. Um, but basically the new uh, escalation of the level of public health threat that has been declared gives the uh, public health authorities the right to legally detain uh, people in order to prevent the spread of disease. When you say it's been a while, how unusual is this, particularly within the region? Are there other countries in Europe implementing these measures? Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on in other countries, but the last time we had quarantine legislation enforced in uh, in. Uh, in, the, uh, in the UK, in the mainland UK, you've got to go back as far as the uh, plague outbreaks of the 1600s to find uh, actual quarantine being enforced. There was a village that uh, famously quarantined itself in 1665. Um, there's legislation that dates to the 1700s as a result, but that was never used. There's legislation that relates to shipping and the last instance I've confined of that was in the 1890s when ships returning from overseas were quarantined. Right, so that really puts it into some historical context for, it, for us, doesn't it? In terms of what prompted this declaration, now how important is it that these new cases came into contact with someone that was a previously confirmed case? So in other words, there's been a lot of debate about their, these so-called super spreaders, people that um, really do shed quite a bit of the disease and that can really accelerate transmission. So, the, so at the moment, the quarantine rules uh, mainly uh, predominantly apply to people who have been brought in from China, on, and, and particularly the um, emergency rescue flights from um, from Hubei province. Um, and so, initially, there was a, a kind of an individual contract that was offered to each of the people who was returned. 
Um, the, so the issue is that it's not much fun being stuck in quarantine. I'm sure that there are lots of uh, things that would add to anxiety, such as concerns about possibly becoming uh, infected by um, contact with a fellow quarantinee. Um, so it's not surprising that people feel the need or the anxiety and, and, and want to kind of discontinue this arrangement. That's really what's prompted this escalation. It's not that the threat has changed so much as the willingness of people to remain. And 14 days is a long time to uh, remain uh, in, in, under quarantine conditions. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard Darwood. Up on the trees and down in the fields. Swarms of locusts are everywhere. A billion of these desert insects are sweeping across East Africa, destroying crops and livelihoods as they fly from one country to the other. 10 million people in the region are now at risk of hunger and famine. We depend a lot on the season and we worry that the locusts will destroy our harvest and we'll end up remaining hungry throughout the rest of the year. Somalia has declared a state of emergency after its worst locust infestation in 25 years. They are breeding in large numbers, mostly in remote areas under the control of Al-Shabaab. And that's making it nearly impossible to fight the world's most dangerous migratory pests. The UN says the most devastating plague of locusts in living memory could be within weeks if the world doesn't do enough to stop the outbreak. We have about 12 million people who are already in need of humanitarian assistance in terms of food security. So it means what we are afraid is that with the, the invasion of a desert locust uh, that is really in huge numbers and the quantity of food that these uh, locusts are eating, we think that it will create uh, a, deterior a further deterioration of the food security situation. Climate experts say an unusual bout of heavy rain in the region and a powerful cyclone in Somalia last year are some of the reasons behind the outbreak. And with more rain predicted in the coming weeks, things are expected to get worse. If the weather conditions prevail and this breeding you're seeing here continues all along uh, northern Somalia, northern Ethiopia, then you end, you'll end up having nearly 500 times the populations that we've already witnessed invading Kenya and parts of southern Ethiopia. Desert locusts can travel up to 150 kilometers a day. From parts of East Africa, millions of them have reached Pakistan, which too has declared a national emergency. The threat of these voracious creatures feeding on farms and fields now seems more widespread and ever more urgent. Priyanka Gupta, Al Jazeera. Storm Kiera has battered the UK and uh, Northern Europe with hurricane force winds and heavy rain. When ba Baumgartner is in London uh, tracking all the details there, I've seen video, Gwen, that I've never seen before coming out of uh, the UK. It, it almost reminded me a lot of Superstorm Sandy here in the, the Jersey Shore when the floodwaters just came rushing in. Yeah, good morning, Anne-Marie. Uh, we begin here in London where the cleanup has begun after Storm Kira violently swept through the UK this weekend. Britain took the brunt of the storm on Sunday with two and a half months of rainfall falling in just 24 hours and winds reaching 100 miles per hour. The storm caused significant damage with downed power lines, flying debris and severe flooding. Some 20,000 homes spent the night without power. Dozens of flights in Northwest Europe were canceled as a result, as conditions were deemed unsafe. The storm is now moving eastwards toward mainland Europe. Five people have died from weather-related incidents so far. Now to Ireland, where a general election has caused a political earthquake in the country. Sinn Féin, which used to be the political wing of the provisional Irish Republican Army, has made unprecedented gains throughout the country. Votes are still being counted, but Sinn Féin are firmly in the lead, leaving the two centrist parties that had governed Ireland for more than a century grappling with the power shift. Both of those parties had said they're unwilling to create a coalition with left-wing Sinn Féin, which could create a political deadlock and trigger another election. And finally to El Salvador, where tensions remain high after an armed standoff inside the country's parliament. The president was about to address lawmakers when heavily armed security forces stormed parliament to demand funding for additional vehicles, uniforms and surveillance equipment. 
The security forces say the money is necessary to combat violent crime in El Salvador, which has one of the highest murder rates in the world. Critics are calling the security forces' action an unprecedented act of intimidation. Now, despite the disruption in parliament, the president has pledged his support in better equipping police and military. He's giving lawmakers one week to back a deal. Anne-Marie. Gwen Baumgartner, thank you so much, Gwen. Army news today. For millions who live along the Great Lakes, the Army Corps of Engineers says three of the five lakes, Michigan, Huron, and Superior, broke January records for water levels. And as Dean Reynolds reports, all that water is now forcing many with waterfront property into a battle to save their homes. The other day, Tish Ganser looked out on the waters of Lake Michigan, the final resting place of her house. Built by her grandfather, most of her lakefront cottage fell off a cliff on New Year's Eve, leaving only a bit of foundation. I just can't believe how much of it is gone. And I'm not a rich person, and I really don't know how I'm going to get out of this. With those 10 to 14 foot waves out here. Nick Bonstell, the director of the Ottawa County Michigan Emergency Management Team, noted that the lakes were at or near their lowest point as recently as 2013. Nobody has seen how quick and how much property has been lost in such a short amount of time with this type of erosion. Across the Great Lakes, the inundation has been accompanied by more frequent and intense storms that have stripped away the sandy base of beachfront homes. There's so many wonderful memories. Rita Alton lives in Manistee, Michigan. Her nearly 70-year-old home lies a few feet from disaster. A third of a mile of her property has already washed away. I'm just sitting here waiting for the rest to go down. A desperate effort by homeowners is now underway to move their houses away from the approaching cliffs or build stone barriers to retain the shifting sands below. There's not many options. It's basically uh, do this or lose your home. The last two years were the wettest in more than a century for the Great Lakes, virtually ensuring another season of unusually high water levels that could turn dream homes into nightmares. Dean Reynolds, CBS News, Montague, Michigan. Violent weather isn't over yet. Tonight, heavy snow is expected in upstate New York and northern New England. More than 30 tornadoes have been reported in recent days, and there were two more tornadoes today in Maryland and Delaware. At least five people are dead in four states. Jeff Begay shows us the destruction. Here's the moment when an apparent tornado rips apart a building in Boyd's, Maryland. That's a training school for dogs that help wounded warriors. This driver dodged death as the wind drove a tree branch through the windshield right into the passenger seat. Ooh, literally in a tornado. Two apparent tornadoes were reported in Maryland. There were no injuries, but some significant damage, with homes destroyed and trees ripped from the ground. These large pine trees that have probably been here for years just fell down like they were toothpicks. Residents aren't sure what hit them. It didn't last long. I mean, it was only like 10 or 15 seconds, it was gone. It just had a whistle to it. It wouldn't last long. I, as soon as I heard it, the roof came off. Today, Georgia assessed the aftermath of a storm that ripped apart houses and flooded neighborhoods. The path of destruction continued north, with winds ripping the roof off Warwick High School in central Pennsylvania. And over a foot of snow in upstate New York and New England. The storm is making for a messy start to the weekend commute. Back on this family farm in Maryland, the winds are picking up once again, and you can already see the damage behind me. This happened earlier in just a matter of seconds when that storm moved through here, bringing those high-powered winds. That right there, that was a shed, but as you can see, it has been totally destroyed. Nora. All right, Jeff, thank you. Every Tuesday, this cistern truck makes its way through rural Tildil. It delivers water to communities that haven't had any for at least five years. Francisco Candia is relieved every time the truck arrives. He used to grow fruit trees and raised goats and donkeys. This area was famous for its donkeys. I used them to take people's produce to market, but that was before the drought destroyed everything. I had to reinvent myself so now, I make these donkeys to sell on the highway, to remind us of when we had live animals. Further off that highway lives Liliana Cortez. 
The 74-year-old rancher used to have more than 100 goats, but the drought has dried up all the grass and bushes they needed to eat, and so now she only has a few animals left. It's been more than a year since we sold them off because we couldn't afford to buy them food and the water we get is only supposed to be for our personal use. It's like a desert here now. Chile's fertile central region, known for its Mediterranean climate, is suffering its longest drought in history. No rain in winter means that there's no snow in the Andes Mountains to melt in the summer, to supply wells, aquifers and reservoirs, which are now critically low. I'm standing in what was the Runga Reservoir. Once upon a time, there were sailboats and jet skis here, but now, as you can see, there's nothing but dry dirt. And it's not just because of the drought, but because the measures needed to protect water in this area were never taken. Despite the increasing water scarcity, Chile's Central Valley is still used for high-intensity agriculture. Those who can afford it perforate more than 100 meters, over-exploiting aquifers and taking the little water that's left. And in the capital, Santiago, no effective measures have been taken to reduce consumption. What we need is to understand our climactic diversity. We have water in abundance in southern Chile, but not here. We urgently need a strong regulatory framework and a culture to save rather than waste water. Green lawns, swimming pools, and parks with grass are not compatible with this new reality. The drought began nearly a decade ago, and studies suggest it will get worse, not better, as global temperatures continue to rise. That could well make this area, once famous for its prickly pears, unfit even for cactuses. Lucia Newman, Al Jazeera, Til Til, Chile. Here in New York City, ambushed in a pair of shootings by the same suspect, the gunman, you see him there, opening fire this morning inside a police precinct in the Bronx. One officer was hit and wounded, police returning fire. That shooter out on parole for an attempted murder conviction, surrendering only after firing every round in his gun. The assassination attempt followed an earlier attack. That same suspect walking up to a marked police van, allegedly asking for directions, then pulling the trigger. Both officers hit are expected to survive, and tonight police are calling the suspect a coward. ABC Stephanie Ramos is outside that precinct tonight. Tonight, the chilling video, a gunman calmly walking into the 41st precinct in the Bronx, an officer seen ducking for cover after hearing gunshots, the gunman then running into another room, his weapon drawn. You can see another officer responds to the scene. In the exchange, one lieutenant is shot in the arm. Police say the suspect unloading his entire clip, eventually dropping to the ground, his gun seen thrown across the precinct floor. Officers then move in, swarming the suspect, one officer punching him repeatedly, while more than a dozen race in. I will point out that this coward immediately laid down, but only after he ran out of bullets. It was just 12 hours earlier, also in the Bronx, when police say the same man ambushed two officers in a police van. 906 Simpson, shots fired. In the van, in the van, guys right here, right here. Authorities say the suspect asked the officers for directions before shooting one of them in the neck. The gunman then running away. The officer's partner immediately driving to the nearest hospital. This was an attempt to assassinate police officers. We need to use that word because it was a premeditated effort to kill. Police say the suspect, Robert Williams, has a lengthy criminal history. He was convicted of attempted murder in 2002 and paroled in 2017. Both officers rushed to the hospital, expected to make a full recovery. Wounded officer Paul Struffolino released from the hospital to the applause of his fellow officers lining up to pay tribute. Thank God that each and every one of them will be okay. We have two officers injured they will be okay in the end. Stephanie Ramos joins us now from the precinct where the second shooting took place. And Stephanie, the other wounded officer also expected to be released from the hospital? 
That's exactly right, Tom. Police tell us that second injured officer is expected to be released from the hospital. A huge sigh of relief for this community and the NYPD. But as you can see, it's still a very active scene here. Police tape up and police standing guard around that precinct. Tom. Shooting at a popular mall, a horrific shooting rampage overseas. Officials say a soldier in northern Thailand armed with an assault rifle opened fire in a number of locations. This security cam footage revealing the chilling sight of a lone gunman carrying a heavy weapon, stalking the floors of that mall. Police surrounding the perimeter, the violence sending families running for their lives, an American among the rescued. At least 20 people are dead tonight. Police say the suspect has been posting on social media throughout his killing spree. We want to warn you, some of the images are disturbing. ABC's Julia McFarlane leading us off. Money, 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 I go, I go. Tonight, a massacre at a popular shopping mall. A man identified as a Thai soldier on a bloody rampage with an assault rifle, posting about the carnage on Facebook. Shooting and killing at least 20 people and injuring dozens more in the city of Nakhon Ratchasima. Police releasing a wanted poster and naming the suspect as Jakrapan Toma. A government official says this all began with a land dispute. The Thai army sergeant reportedly shot a superior officer at an army base. Shoppers running for their lives as a shooter opened fire. Police warning people to stay focused, hide safely and mute mobile phones. This security camera footage revealing the chilling sight of the lone gunman carrying a heavy weapon stalking the floors of the Terminal 1 Korat Mall. Gunfire erupting as the troops push deeper into the mall, terrified passers-by crouching for cover in the parking lot. Tonight, the gunman is still at large. Tonight, authorities say at least one U.S. citizen was rescued unharmed. The State Department urging citizens to stay away from the area and to check in with loved ones. Tom? Julia McFarlane leading us off on that horrific shooting. All right, Julia. Now to the latest on the massive 2017 Equifax cyber attack that compromised the personal information of nearly 150 million people. Four Chinese military officials have been charged. The Justice Department released their pictures at a news conference earlier today. Names, addresses, credit card information, social security numbers all leaked, and an investigation showed that Equifax failed to fix a web server vulnerable to hackers. So CBS News Chief Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent Jeff Gaze is following this story for, for, for us from Washington. Uh, Jeff, what can you tell us about the suspects? Um, as we mentioned, that we know that they worked for the Chinese military. Well, that's right, and it's going to be hard for U.S. officials to get them into custody. In fact, they acknowledged today that that was highly unlikely, but this is, you know, part of the pattern that we've seen in the past with Chinese hackers. Often, uh, they are linked back to Chinese military, and that's what this was, according to investigators and intelligence operations, to gather as much information about Americans as possible, and the numbers are really staggering. 145 million or so Americans personal data gathered in this hack that's uh, nearly a uh, half of all Americans. So Jeff, what exactly were the hackers after? Well, they were off after social security information, driver's license information, date of birth information, your name. So everything that is valuable to any American in terms of uh, your personal information when you go to purchase a, a car or buy a house or anything like that. So this is uh, the, the type of breach that uh, could uh, do a significant amount of damage to any American's personal information. But, you know, I did ask the FBI, what is happening with this information that was stolen? Is it being used? So far, they say it hasn't been used, uh, which really fits a pattern with uh, Chinese hackers. Uh, we've seen in the past with previous breaches that they, they often gather up as much information as they possibly can and then hold on to the information. The question is, uh, to what end? So you mentioned that the likelihood of the Justice Department getting their hands on these people who have been uh, indicted probably pretty low. So then what are the next steps in the investigation? Well, the, the, what happened today is a major step in an investigation like this when, you know, according to U.S. officials, you have a nation state behind this kind of breach. Uh, one thing U.S. officials try to do is name the offender to 
uh, in their view, hopefully prevent future hacks. It, it doesn't seem like it's the kind of uh, tactic that's working. We've just, you know, we see so many of these. The difference here is the sheer volume of Americans affected by this. Uh, but part of the uh, method of, op of operation for U.S. officials, U.S. investigators, is to name and shame whoever uh, is behind these high-profile hacks. All right, Jeff Pegues for us. Thank you very much, Jeff. My pleasure. Syrian government forces in the suburbs of Sarakib, hours before the strategic town fell after fierce fighting with its Syrian rebel defenders. <laughs> Sarakib sits at the junction of two major highways and was seen as a major obstacle in regaining control of Idlib province, one third of which is now under Syrian government control. Turkey has warned pro-Damascus forces to back off. Unfortunately, the Syrian regime does not believe in political process and thinks peace can only be possible by a military solution. And I have to say, they are wrong about this. They have stepped up their aggression. Turkey has 12 military observation posts positioned around Idlib de-escalation zone, agreed with Russia and Iran in 2017. But nine of them have been surrounded by advancing Syrian government forces. To protect Sarakib and stop the advance, Turkey established four more posts which ended up in direct clashes between the Turkish and Syrian armies. Saldırılara meşru müdafaa kapsamında misli ile karşılık verilmiştir. The attacks were responded to within the scope of self-defense. From now on, any kind of attack will be responded to appropriately and our observation posts will continue their duties. The Syrian government has intensified its attacks since last November and, backed by Russia, has targeted civilians. This triggered a new wave of migration with hundreds of thousands of people fleeing the violence. In the nine-year-long civil war in Syria, Idlib was where the displaced could find refuge. But Idlib's city center is now under threat as the Syrian government forces captured Sarakib and just seven kilometers away. Sinam Kosolo, Al Jazeera, Bab el Hawa, Northwestern Syria. Sunday's weekly cabinet meeting, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned both Hamas and Islamic Jihad. I want to make it very clear, we will not accept any aggression from Gaza. Just a few weeks ago, we killed the Islamic Jihad senior commander in Gaza. And I suggest Islamic Jihad and Hamas refresh their own memory. I will not go into the details of activities and all our plans in the media, but we are ready to deliver crushing action against the terrorist organizations in Gaza. Since the advent of the peace proposal by President Trump, Islamic Jihad and Hamas vowed resistance and retaliation. When the Palestinian people feel the great danger that the Palestinian cause is facing because of the deal of the century and because of the American positions, it's natural and rightful of the Palestinian people to send confrontation messages to the whole world that they are fully prepared to do anything to fight for their rights, to fight for the future of their children and the future of next generations of Palestinians on this land. Since the announcement of Trump's peace plan, over a dozen rockets and mortars have been fired into southern Israel. And that's not all. They're sending explosive devices attached to balloons that can travel up to 25 miles from Gaza. They pose a threat to civilians, especially children who might see these balloons as a toy and not understand the danger. Israeli Defense Minister Naftali Bennett met with Israel's Southern Command and promised no one would be immune from Israel's defense forces. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Virginia recently became the 38th state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. The deadline to ratify it expired decades ago, but Monday the House Rules Committee is meeting in Washington to remove the deadline. Victoria Cobb, president of the Family Foundation of Virginia, joins us now. Victoria, you're opposed to the ERA. Are you concerned the House will be able to advance it with this change? Well, certainly we don't believe that amendments can work in perpetuity, that we can propose something in the 70s and it can be valid in 2020. So we are concerned about Congress's actions, but we know that the court should be able to stand strong on how our founders intended us to ratify an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Why do you think that the ERA is bad for women? Well, it is not a matter of equality for, Virginia, for women, which is what people always say. It's actually a matter of the fact that this language is attempting to make women and men 
the same. And that has tremendously terrible outcomes on issues like abortion and on things that are so personal as in our school locker rooms and bathrooms and what does biological sex really mean versus how people feel about their gender. Many legal experts say the only way to revive the ERA is for Congress to pass it again and start over asking states to ratify it. Do you think there's an appetite in Congress and nationally to do that? Well, certainly people believe in equality for, for, for women and we believe that we have it. Certainly there is an idea that we can continue to move those uh, societal concepts forward, but the need for a constitutional amendment simply isn't there. The courts have been very clear. Our constitution already ensures equality for, for women in the fifth and 14th amendment. So we think we are where we need to be and we simply need to let this terrible wording and this vague idea that is outdated and not valid go. Victoria, Virginia's new Democratic leadership is systematically transforming your state. Both chambers of the legislature have passed new protections for LGBTQ people. What does this mean for religious institutions? Well, we're deeply concerned because many of the laws that are being passed do not seem to have ample uh, exceptions for faith communities, not just churches, but we're talking about Christian schools. We're talking about outreach ministries of churches like homeless shelters. Um, so we are doing everything we can to attempt to block these from passing both chambers. But we do need to make the faith community aware that we are going to have to rally and we may have to litigate when our religious freedom comes into play once these go into effect if we are unsuccessful. Tell us about, about no, have I've got lots to tell you. Go on, just give us Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Is that your reaction to what people who want you off the spotty shortlist? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And what about you being stripped of your belt? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, uh, you must be very unhappy with that. What's your reaction to that? Jesus loves me and he loves you too and he loves you too. He loves these people in here and he loves everybody in the world. You th All you've got to do is repent of your sins and you will be, be forgiven. And do you think you can win Spotty? Do you want to win Spotty? John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall have eternal life and shall not perish. Okay, Tyson. Uh, any, final, any final message to those people who, who have criticised you in recent? There's been a lot of criticism from people in signing petitions to the Scottish national people, to all sorts of people. Yes, yes, yes. Just, give us, just give us your take on it. Do you stand by your comments? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, Tyson. The only way is through Jesus into heaven. That's all I can say. The A to Z, the Alpha, the Omega. Tyson. Jesus is the way, the key, and the only way into heaven. Okay, Tyson, thank Peace you out. so much. Thanks for stopping. Thank you.